let's just start, I reckon. So hello, everyone. Welcome back to another virtual event with uh, Calyptus, we're Web3's career community for senior builders. Um, it's great to see everyone here, uh, a lot of new faces, actually. Um, we've actually mixed it up today. Uh, we're doing a little bit earlier than usual, but it looks like actually it's it's played off pretty well. We've still got some uh, some faces who have come along. Um, Peter's based in Brisbane, Australia, but I thought it was a good experiment to try out different times as well. Um, but thanks for all for, for joining. Um, we're very honored to have Peter here today. Uh, Peter has 25 years experience in traditional software engineering and research oriented roles, reaching senior positions at Oracle and RSA before jumping all into crypto from 2017 onwards, becoming co-chair for cross-chain interoperability for Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, reaching technical director at Consensus, and now head of blockchain in, uh, research at Immutable, the leading Web3 company powering the next generation of Web3 games. That's probably the longest introduction I've done so, so far, Peter, but you've got a lot of accolades. Um, so, you know, we're very excited to have you here today speaking about AI to find bugs in Solidity code. As usual, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat. Uh, uh, just, yeah, chuck them in there as and when, and then myself and Callum will find uh, the perfect time to interrupt uh, Peter uh, uh, and, and enable him to answer them. But that's it from me. Peter, over to you. Yeah, all right. Thank you for that great introduction. And um, let's share some slides. Um, so um, the good old way we say hello these days, can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. There <laughs> you go. All right. So let's learn about AI. Um, so this wasn't, um, this talk had help. So I had a lot of people giving me feedback and you should always acknowledge people. Um, and well, how we're going to start this is by looking at AI image generators. They actually tell us a lot about AI and where things are at. Um, then we're going to talk about the methodology that I've used in my analysis and talk about some buggy codes, more buggy code, and really have a look at things and also look at the legal stuff because that's important too. So AI image generators, they're um, tools that are out there where you give a prompt, some text, and you'll get a image output. So mid-journey is one of them, where you type in some text and you'll get, say, those um, pieces of armor there. And um, you, um, for instance, when you have that produced, you can say, all right, well, I want to upsize, say, U1, which is the top left, or U2, the top right, U3, bottom left, U4, the bottom right, or I want to create variations upon them. And then they'll um, the AI will go off and try and create variations on that. And um, there's a whole heap of parameters and everything um, is actually quite configurable um, with mid-journey. Um, and so if I, I put in a term Ethereum Engineering Group, which is another group that I'm involved in, and um, it generated this. And if you look at it, you've got four quite different images. And one thing that actually I thought about with this AI generation is if you're generating spacey sci-fi stuff, you don't have a really good idea of what it's going to look like. You know, you don't have a preconception of what the output should be. And so it's easy to generate something when you are when you have no fixed expectation. Whereas if you had a fixed expectation, I think it's a little bit harder. So I took, you know, one of those images, I upsized it, um, and then I created variations upon it, and then upsized that again. And so, you know, you can do all sorts of interesting things and create, you know, quite intricate pieces of information. Um, but then I tried it again and I got completely different results. And so what this is about is that any of these algorithms, they use a seed. And so for mid-journey, it's a 32-bit seed. And so the output you get, even if you have exactly the same prompt, will be different each time you do it. And so these um, language versions are the same. You will not necessarily get the same output given an input. And you can tell it to focus in and be more deterministic with the output, or you can give it more leeway to um, have variable results. So there are parameters that you can tune um, to change the output and some more um, output that are produced. 
And um, I tried another um, figure, another tool called stable diffusion. And so if you look at this, you've got, you know, some quite different um, output and you even have there some mangled faces. And so it's tried to create unique faces, but it has ended up not doing a very good job. And in fact, this is another one that it produced. And you've got some guy like who's coming out of a table. So pretty or, you know, gory and pretty horrible ones, you know, things to get nightmares about. And but, it, you know, it's interesting that it's producing a result which is completely wrong. You know, it's not what you would expect. And so it's a completely wrong result. Um, I also used another one called Image Creator. And again, I'm saying, give me Ethereum engineering group. And it created this. And I went, really? Ethereum engineering? And then it created this. And I said, well, what about Ethereum engineering creating the future? And you go, what? And, you know, I can see there's some gold um, here that's falling into her hand and, you know, which is pretty futuristic and everything. But still, this is really strange. And then um, my daughter walked past and said, why have you got the anime filter on? And so you can you can see here that if you don't know how to use a tool, you get really weird results. And so I had this anime filter on and was getting anime out of this tool. And so I guess what this is showing is that you can create all sorts of interesting stuff, but if you don't spend time learning how to use the tool, you are going to get some strange results. And also you could do image input as well, and it was able to create some variations based on something created by the other tool which was interesting in itself. So some takeaways from that brief look at image generation. So each of the AI tools work quite differently. So the, um, the Stable Diffusion um, program, it will you can download it and run it on your own laptop. Whereas the um, Mid Journey, it's some huge backend server system. And so you obviously, if you're running something on your own computer, the copyright, ownership, and all the rest of it is very different to if you're uploading something into the cloud. Um, and so they're, they're designed differently as well, um, to, and they're aim, aiming to do different things. Um, and another thing I found was that I was able to get quite different results from each time I went along and used the tool. So they're being updated all the time. So even by the time you've listened to this talk, so some of the results that I'm going to talk about will be out of date because the tools will have been updated. And, you know, they, these are literally being updated, say, once a month, every month. And obviously it's very much uh, a case of um, massive competition. And so not all the players in the market are going to be around in the future, without doubt. So um, what I did for it was say, look, can we use AI to analyze Solidity code and find bugs? So I know this talk is about Solidity, but really you should be thinking, can I use AI to find bugs in software, in any written in any computer programming language? And so I, I used um, ChatGPT um, language model from V3.5 and V4, Perplexity and Google Bard. So Perplexity, the aim is, there is that it will always tell you where it's got its information from. Google Bard is one that's by Google and it has only recently been released. Um, and OpenAI has been around um, since the start. Um, Google Copilot, I had a quick look at that too. And so Copilot, it's all about code generation at the moment. It's not about analyzing stuff that exists. Um, that said, Google Copilot chat is coming. So that's another thing that's coming over the horizon. So when I looked at the, um, the code, I um, ended up classifying the results as being bugs. So it's actually found a bug. Improvements, it's saying how you can improve the code wrong it's just got something completely wrong and you know you um, want to discount that completely and if you followed that advice you'd essentially go off a cliff so that's bad strange where you, you get a nonsensical result but you end up having to read and reread to try and work out what's going on and filler stuff which is 
probably helpful if you're a newbie. And I, I noticed that a lot of you um, are actually reasonably new to Web3. So that could actually be quite useful for you. But if you're a more experienced person, it's just going to be extra stuff to read and not overly helpful. So um, what I ended up doing was creating a um, some code. And so I've got some code here. Um, and um, so can people have a bit of a, you know, spend a few secs reading the code? And can you try and see if you can work out any bugs in that code? And um, feel free to either put stuff in chat or maybe um, you could even um, go off mute and um, just put it out there what you think the issue is. Okay, we don't have anyone proffering uh, an answer. All right. What about if I change the variable names to something a little bit clearer, um, a bit better? So can people um, work out what the bug might be now? So require is a, well, it's a Boolean, right? But then you're trying to do a string on there on the, I can't see the line, but after the modifier, when not passed, that's one. So the require, not, not paused. Pa yeah, yeah, but that's, not a, paused that's a bool. Yeah. 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 Trying so to that, that, compare it to a string, which. Yeah, that's not how. There. So how, how require works is you have a Boolean, and then you have a comma, and then you have the string that would be returned as the result um, for the revert. So that's actually, um, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah. So when not paused, so require not paused. So, I think that the set functions has a nonsensical name, meaning opposite to what the function actually does. Exactly, the logic's wrong. So you're going pause, and then not paused. So not paused is, um, so if you're going to pause something, then not paused should be false. And similarly here. So there, there, there are two of the bugs that are in there. Um, there are other bugs as well. And that is anyone, actually, I'll do just, oh yeah. yeah there's no um, checking, right? Yeah, there's no, there's no, yeah, there's no um, checking. There's no authentication. So, um, you know, so there's a few things going on here. One is that we could have an abstract contract. Um, you could have a custom error as well that would reduce the gas. So rather than doing a require, you could have if, if not stuff, um, then um, revert, and then you could have a custom error paused, and that would save gas. Um, you've also got um, the um, access control for stuff seven, stuff nine, and you've got the actual state variables being around the wrong way. So um, that. So let's see if we um, run some open AI, uh, some AI tools on this code here, this stuff one, where you've got no real cues as to what's going on. And so it came back saying, um, you know, the code you've provided is written in solidity. Yep, top of the class. Um, and um, I've reviewed the code and there are no bugs. Um, and I can suggest some improvements. So the naming conventions, it's recommending that I follow the naming conventions and function names should typically start with a lowercase letter. Hmm, but they do. Um, so it's actually correct in what it's saying, but it's a waste of time because I'm already doing it. So that's confusing. Um, explicit modifiers. So it's starting to um, talk about default visibility, and that hasn't been a thing for a very long time in Solidity. So again, that's something that's referring to a previous era. So it's an outdated piece of information. So that's confusing. Um, and then 
the error message provided in the require statement is useful for debugging and providing information to users, correct? However, it's generally better to have a more specific error message. Really? And so it even offered some improved code. And if you look at it, it's improved error messages, contract is paused rather than paused, which I don't know about you, but that doesn't feel very helpful. So chat GPT overall big fail. Um, and then of course it did offer me some parting advice of, by the way, you should do a security audit would be a really good idea. And I agree. So didn't find anything useful. Some of the um, answers didn't really match the Solidity version and were a bit confusing. So chat GPT-4, so the newer version of the language model. Um, so it says, all right, you're using Solidity um, and it doesn't appear to be any syntax errors. Um, and then it gave me a description of the code. So it actually gave me a breakdown of what it perceived the code was doing, which is good, you know, but not really helpful. Um, and then it did notice the access control issue. So it did notice that stuff seven and stuff nine were open to anyone in the world modifying to change the state of stuff one. And so that's a pretty good catch. So no one in the audience, you know, went and today caught when I we just had stuff seven, stuff nine, that there was actually an access control issue, whereas the um, the tool did. So that's an interesting catch all by itself. So, you know, it found a probable access control issue, which I think is good. Perplexity didn't find any bugs. It gave lovely reference information and lovely background information that would be great if you were new to programming. Um, but it didn't find any issues. And Bard said, yes, there's a bug in the code. Stuff three modifier requires stuff one to be true, but stuff four, a function requires um, not stuff one. This means that it is possible to call stuff four when stuff in one is false, which could cause the modifier to fail. And you think, what? So anyone who knows Solidity is now going, I don't think this, you know, what's just been said does not make any sense. And so, yeah, that was a really confusing thing. And then it advised us to get rid of the um, inversion of um, stuff one, which is, again, not right. So that um, had, so it had no basis to do that and essentially um, advised us to do something that's wrong. So didn't find any issues and suggested a um, inserting a bug. So if we look at the tools with that poorly named bit of code, um, ChatGPT found something, which is pretty amazing. We did have some wrong answers, though, from the other tools, um, which would be, you know, not good. So you'd need to have someone who really knows what they're doing reviewing the output. So what about if we give it the better um, names. You now we, we improved the names. And so now, um, you know, we've got the same issues with the code, but better naming. And so when we use ChatGPT, it did find the access control problem this time. Um, but then it had some confusing stuff around gas costs that didn't make any sense. And also it talked about state persistence. Um, so the state of not paused variable is not persisted between in contract invocations. Well, it's in storage, so it is. So that was just um, very confusing. Um, chat GPT-4 did find a bug. So it found um, the logic error that we've talked about, um, and it suggested the corrected code. And um, so, you know, it gave us some example code of this is how to fix your code. Um, and it also found the access control issue. So that was pretty good. Um, Perplexity, again, had great advice, but didn't find any bugs. Um, and Bard um, found an issue um, and su suggested a solution. So it actually found the access control issue, which was pretty good. Um, and it, its solution was make internal. So that's good. So overall, um, that time with just by naming the variables better, um, you know, chat GPT 3.5 actually found a bug, 
GPT-4 found two of the bugs and Bard found one. So, and we only had one strange thing out of chat GPT 3.5. So not actually too bad. So what about if we put a few more comments into the code and, um, you know, to try and help things along a bit. And um, so this time, chat GPT 3.5 came out with some strange stuff and um, GPT-4 found a bug and another bug. Um, Perplexity still hasn't found anything. And Bard started, um, found a bug, but then told us about um, stuff that was just wrong and also had a confusing result. So again, you know, by adding some comments in, um, we sort of helped things, I think, a little bit, but maybe not a lot. But then this is an interesting one. And this is why maybe if I'd had better comments again, um, we'd be somewhere, um, you know, doing the tools would have done much better. So what I've said is initially starts in the contract in the not paused state. So that would mean that not paused needs to be true at the start. So I've introduced an extra bug. And the only indication that this is a bug is by me writing the word not there. And um, what I, the interesting thing was chat GPT was able to detect that the, the comment did not match the code. And so for me, this is super powerful. So a static code analysis tool would not have found that bug, but this did because it can look at the, the names of the variables and the comments and try and reason about do the, do the comments match what the code's doing? So if you had have had some algorithm written in pseudocode in the comments even, then you could imagine it could um, read that and look at the actual code and say, hey, I think you've got a bug here. So that's really very powerful. Um, okay, so what about if you change the prompt? So I've just had... Are there any bugs in the following code? What about if you go, are there any bugs in the following code? Can you suggest improvements? And so asking for suggestions suddenly yielded much better results. Perplexity found three errors. And so did ChatGPT for 3.5. And so I was thinking about, so what's going on here? And what I think it is, is the definition of what a bug is. So a suggestion is a way of improving the code, maybe. And whereas, you know, so chat GPT is probably taking the perspective of anything that could be a suggestion that looks bad, let's just, you know, suggest it because maybe it's wrong. Whereas chat GPT 3.5 and perplexity, at least, we're probably, um, you know, maybe taking a narrower view. So it's interesting, just based on the language, you get different results. So what about a much better prompt? So um, some Raz, James and Felipe um, worked on something where they ended up having this big, long prompt here, where it's being very, very... Um, you know, directed. So, you know, provide an exhaustive list of all the issues and vulnerabilities inside the following con smart contract. Um, so there's a bit of um, English language stuff here, but don't worry about that. Um, so put an issue description, actors involved, include one exploit scenario for each vulnerability, output as mark a markdown table with a list of objects and have the following... Um, the following titles for the columns and even say, all right, well, for this mark out severity with emojis. So um, when you did that, then you end up with something like this, where you're getting a description of the issue, the action that can be taken, the, you know, the, the, the severity, which is obviously an AI tool's idea of severity, which might not match reality, but still, and, you know, who could do this um, exploit? and the exploit scenario. So, and I think importantly, let's have a line number so you can look at the line of code to try and work out what's going on. So just by changing the prompt, we've got quite different output. So it shows that playing around with the prompt a bit is probably worthwhile. 
So what about some more buggy code? Um, so have a look at this code here and um, tell me if you can work out what bugs might be in the code. All right. The, the flash loan, you need to have a reentrancy guard. So the reason why you want to have something like that on it is that um, you might do a flash loan and then come back into this flash loan contract. And so I know I've only got the flash loan function there, but you could imagine you could have a deposit function as well. And you wouldn't want the person to do a flash loan and then use the loan to create a deposit and then exit out of it and then have a deposit and then be able to withdraw funds. So there have been lots and lots of attacks on flash loan um, products and flash loan contracts, and um, not having a re-entrancy re guard is one of them. So can the tools find the lack of re-entrancy guard? And so ChatGPT did find it, which was pretty good. All right, what about this one? Um, this is a, um, a more complex problem. Um, can anyone have a look at this code and see if they can work out what the bug might be? I'll give you I'll give you thirty seconds on this one. This one's so. For that matter, have a look at the code and tell, I mean, someone who's a brave soul. Just say what you're seeing when you're looking at this code and what you're thinking about. Doesn't implement proxy, you cannot change implementation. Um, yeah, this is that's true. Um, so this is just a this is not an upgradable proxy. It's just a plain proxy. Um, but yeah, so something about how the code is delegated by the caller. Um, not quite. You're you're almost getting there, but not quite. Um, so um, that implementation um, variable there is going to be in storage slot zero. And so for the implementation contract that you're proxying to, you're going to have a storage collision for storage slot zero. So that means that the um, if you have, say, a um, variable in storage slot zero, so they essentially just define a normal variable in storage, then it will clash with implementation. So if you overwrite that, you could change the implementation contract next time the proxy is called. The other secondary issue is a function selector collision. So I've made implementation public. And what that means is that there will be a function defined called implementation taking no parameters. And so if you had another function in the implementation contract with the same function selector, you'd have a collision. And um, so you wouldn't be able to do that call. So normally you'd have something like proxy underscore implementation if you really wanted to do that. And um, for that one, the AI tools didn't find any bugs at all. Um, ChatGPT 3.5 and 4 did find some minor improvements, but they didn't actually find the bug. Okay. Um, what have we got here? Let's see if I... Let's see if we can work this one out. Let's have a look at this. See, I'm trying to think if I can even work this one out. So what we're seeing is we've got an abstract contract. So that means that we're expecting this to be inherited by something else. Uh, the comment says it's an upgradable um, contract. Ah, yeah, I know what the problem is. So there are two problems. One is we're saying it's an upgradable contract. And another thing that's telling us that is there's an initialized function rather than a constructor. 
And so given the initialized function and even that given this comment, then we know it's upgradable. And if it's upgradable, then we should be using access control upgradable and not just access control. And as well as that, we should define a storage gap immediately after the last storage variable in the contract. So that then when we upgrade it to a new version, and if we have to put a new variable in pause, we're not gonna have storage collisions. So the AI tools didn't find that one either. So what about reveal, reviewing some real code? So the issue that I found was that you get this error in, if you're just using plain chat GPT. You know, the, what the message you've submitted is too long. <laughs> and um, though, um, you know, so if the contract's too big, then you're not going to, it's not going to work. And so I um, tried using um, a code, bit of code called GPACT, which is a large and complicated bit of code. And it had 21,931 tokens. So a token is essentially a word or any um, like bracket or anything that's going to go into the language tool. And so, um, yeah, so that didn't work. And so um, when I read up more, it turns out that um, you can have um, 8K and 32K language models, and it depends on the language model version you're using. Um, and I, yeah, so you can use um, the um, API tool rather than the interactive tool. And so, again, I borrowed from um, Raz and um, Co a tool and I modified it slightly, but it takes a, a um, flattened Solidity file. So you first thing you do is you flatten it so that all the inherited files are in one file. And then you pass it in um, using this little script here. And um, then you just do the open AI create call and um, bang out the response. And so it then comes down to which model you're using. So um, the preview, the model that you were able to use about a month ago when I originally wrote this talk was this GPT 3.5 Turbo, which allowed you to have 4,096 tokens. Um, so you can think of that's probably 4,000 and maybe if you multiply by say four or five and you've got say how many kilobytes the file, the source file could be maybe. Um, and if you had GPT-4 or GPT-4-32K, then you can have bigger files. So you can see that, you know, if you can get access to the right language model, then you can do better things. Um, there was a wait list, um, but very recently, a new version of GPT-3.5 has come out that allows you to have more tokens. And I think you can pay to have um, 8,000 tokens. So a moderate size Solidity file. All right, legal stuff. I'm not a lawyer. And um, so, you know, take this all with a grain of salt. But um, so when you um, have a look at the terms of use for ChatGPT, it says you own your input. So um, the file that you submit. Um, and in fact, you've all got the license to the output. So you own it. Um, but say if um, you type in... Um, where does the sun rise, then um, it's going to come back with an answer like the sun rises in the east um, for two days a year. Um, for all the other days, it rises slightly um, northeast or um, southeast, depending on um, what the time of year and where you're sitting. So, you know, if everyone asks the same question, it's going to give the same output. So not every, your output isn't going to be unique, is something to remember. Um, and as well, it can use your input to create a better tool if you're using the non-API. So in other words, if you're using the interactive chat, then chat GPT is learning from your input. But if you use the API version, then it isn't going to do that. You can also submit a request to not have the model use your input. So that's an interesting one in itself. So if you're using closed source code and you're using this tool, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that it's not going to reuse your input for someone else's output. 
Um, perplexity um, was interesting that you agree not to republish content uh, without clearly citing that you use perplexity as the tool. So they're obviously wanting people to um, say, hey, we use perplexity and we're not misrepresenting that we created the stuff ourselves. Um, and so you own, re retain the IP, um, and, but um, they've got a worldwide license to use, host and reproduce your stuff, which they say is all related to, you know, multi-hosting around the world and distribution. Um, but, you know, you grant them the license to use it for um, improving the service. Um, so they're going to use your stuff. Um, yeah, and then there was this IP rights as well, where they're essentially saying, don't train your AI tool using their AI tool. Um, Bard um, had the, the a special terms of use for the AI and their general terms of use. The general terms of use is like Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, it's huge. Um, and really, the so your stuff remains your, your stuff, but um, it's allowed to reproduce your stuff and publish it um, and make it visible to others if you ask it to. Um, but it also can create derivative works of your stuff, say for translation and reformatting. Um, and then the AI terms um, of use essentially said that um, you can't use your Google Bard to create another AI tool. So don't train your tool off Google Bard. So um, limitation. So ChatGPT4 costs US 20 a month at the moment. Um, I didn't play for any other services. Um, if you pay, I'm sure you can get better stuff. So AI tools can find bugs in Solidity. Um, they can find bugs that static code analysis is not going to find. Um, they're um, not going to find everything. And a lot of the stuff they pop out is um, maybe not helpful. And so you need a trained person to look at it. Um, I, at the moment, I don't think they're suitable for, uh, for CI loops because I don't think there's going to be a way of saying, please don't tell me about these existing things that you've already told me about. Um, but maybe you could. Maybe that could be another input. Um, so based on my study, I'd be using ChatGPT4, but all the other tools are getting better you know, whilst you watch them. So maybe using multiple tools is a good idea. Um, and so, you know, you've got to have human reviewers as well. You're going to still have to have code auditors. Um, and so it was interesting how just changing the prompt a bit, saying suggestions rather than just find bugs had a very different output. So that's an interesting thing to think about. So rather than trust but verify, I think it's, it's a possible indication um, but you, you always want to verify the results. Um, and there's a lot of links to um, things. Oh, and there's a, a merch store as well um, for, um, and in particular, that T-shirt there um, has a whole heap of AI generated stuff. I should have blown that one up, shouldn't I? Anyway, so I have talked for a while and I'm going to stop sharing. And um, are there any questions? So, so first of all, it was, I'm hearing myself, just a second. Yeah, we can hear you. I'm sorry, but what did you say? Sorry, I'm just uh, kind of the voice level. Uh, first of all, thank you for an awesome presentation, which at least for me, I assume also for others, basically introduced the domain, which um, I almost know nothing about. So I'm here, uh, just two straight away questions. The first of which is, is currently the paid version or the upgraded model, is it the only version which allows me to, to switch into using chat GPT version four? Yeah, yeah, you could have paid for um, using GPT four. That's correct, um, yeah. But it's only $20 a month, so it's not a lot of money uh, I guess. Um, and you can, um, what I would say is use, if you were going to start using the tools, I'd just start, um, I'd start by just using chat GPT 3.5, because at some point, probably in the next, in the coming months, they'll come out with chat GPT 5, 
and then four will be free and 3.5 will not be available. So yeah, I wouldn't be, I'd just start getting used to using the tool as a starting point. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, now my other question is with regard to multi, multi-file code projects. I know that uh, you can pass or feed the chat GPT with, with a link into your GitHub repository. And this will allow you to scan the, the entire set of files. Are there other ways which which can which will allow me to to, to feed uh, a, a purely local code folder into ChatGPT? I yeah, I think you could. So there are plugins to do all sorts of things, um, and yeah, there are literally hundreds of plugins. And so I'm sure there will be a plugin that you could use that would feed files from your local hard disk in. Um, I'm sure that's um, that'll be a thing, um, but I haven't tried any. Okay, okay, got you. Thanks, um, Tom. I can see you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I, I was wondering what your take is on saying that some piece of code is actually a, a bug or contains bugs. I mean, you mentioned it briefly that the issue might be the definition of the bug. But regarding, for example, the very first piece of code with a better naming, wouldn't it better or a fairer prompt to basically just ask it to point out inconsistencies between functionality of vari or function variable names and functionality? I mean, technically, setting a value of a variable called uh, pause to false in a function called pause is not a bug. I mean, if you run the code, it will take correctly set the value to false. The issue really is that uh, there is an inconsistency between the name of the function and its effect. Uh, yes, yes. And so I guess it depends on on who you are as to what a bug is, isn't it? And see, this is why, like, um, coming up with a prompt which is very precise um, can be very helpful. Um, but also, I mean, what it's showing is, though, that having well-named variables um, is important. Um, and because then, you know, you can pick up that. But yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, though. It does come down to your definition. Thank um, you. Yeah. Okay. So Peter uh, Rourke said, suspect those fuzzing tools could use AI to target the key areas or pathways through code. Quite probably. Could you Could you use it to generate scribble verification code? No idea. Maybe. Yep. Um, have you tried using GPT-4 to evaluate and classify an output and prove the prompt? Um, no, I haven't spent enough time on it. So, um, and I, I don't think there's going to be any magic prompt that'll be the optimal one. I think that um, you just need to play with it a bit. Um, and um, yeah, but I dare say once you've um, played with it a bit and um, someone will publish, say, the script they're using and then, um, yeah, and then from there you'll be away. Or given that we've got all these plugins that people are producing, you may find that someone will create the Solidity bug finding um, plugin and that'll be the optimal one and then everyone will go off and use that so they won't even worry about what the prompt is. Okay, so are there any other questions? Ah, yes. I, is there any way to get a get fresh fresh data into them? That's a great question. I um I do believe that um, there are ways and means. I didn't try that out, but that is something that I think. Um, for some of the tools, not chat GPT, but some of the others you can do, you can, there are ways of feeding um, late, the latest and greatest information in. But um, yeah, I, it is a, in a very fast moving field like um, blockchain. Yes, September 2021 feels like a very long time ago. You know, we're all younger then. Um, yeah. Okay, looks like we've run out of questions. So have a great morning, evening, noon or night, I guess.
Cheers, Peter. That was uh, an incredible talk. Um, and yeah, it was very, very clear and concise, going to a lot of depth clearly into this. I was kind of intrigued to see if you're going to be doing this on a quarterly or a, or a kind of biannual basis to see <laughs> how the accuracy develops over time. Because of course, it's going to probably happen rapidly. Um, you know, we'd love to have you back on to even check in on how things are going. Yeah, it's funny. I've I've I end up doing work on a lot of different things, and um, I will I may end up um, doing more work on it as we you know because we're going to be using it as part of our contract auditing at Immutable. Um, so I may do an update on this, but um, yeah, a lot of my uh, research at the moment is on staking design, like proof of stake, um, deep delegated proof of stake, multi staking, restaking, and um, stuff like that. So all this solidity stuff is is an interesting side topic, but um, not part of the main game. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, if this is a hobby, then uh, yeah, you're you're smashing it. <laughs> um, thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Um, and yeah, I mean, from the whole community. Thanks for all coming today. Um, hopefully see you all again, Peter. Yeah, brilliant talk. Yeah, all right, not a problem. All right, see you, you all best. later. And have a great uh, day. Bye-bye. Thank yeah. you, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, Peter.